Welcome. This is Dr. Brian Buchanan from the Department of Critical Care Medicine at the University of Alberta. This discussion today is on assessment of RV function in the critically ill. This is a brief presentation which has been drawn from the rounds that were presented today on November 16th. I'd like to highlight some recurring themes on bedside echocardiography. First off, it's important that you require multiple views in patients. Avoid foreshortening. Just to make sure you confirm any hypothesis you have, but also it's important to note not to take too much time, particularly when assessing the patient who is critically ill. Cardiac ultrasound is one of the most challenging modalities of bedside ultrasound and takes time. Focused cardiac ultrasound, or goal-directed echo, is really focused towards clinical integration, like evaluation of cardiac or respiratory failure in decision making rather than to focusing on discrete details, enough to glean the important information to help you manage a patient at the bedside. Any clinical correlation like integrating bedside clinical findings and historical items are important to, to consider. We'll start off by highlighting some key views as we previously discussed. At points three and four on the peristernum, generally around the third or fourth inner space, we can see the personal only axis view displayed in image three. In image four, with the probe rotated towards the marker towards the left shoulder, we can see the short axis view. On point five, with the probe placed immediately infralateral to the nipple in left lateral decubitus, we can see the apical four chamber in image five. And finally, below the xiphoid process, we can see the subcostal IVC in image two, or SIVC in the sagittal plane, and finally with the probe rotated 90 degrees from the IVC view and depressed beneath the sternum, we can see the subcostal four-chamber view, or the so-called subcostal long axis view. Now on to the forgotten ventricle, or the right ventricle. The following uh, guidelines and articles are helpful references, uh, article by Krishnan and Schmidt which was done uh, in around 2015, I believe, which talks about acute right ventricular dysfunction in terms of monitoring and managing echocardiography. You, for a more in-depth uh, discussion and, and guidelines, you can refer to the ASC document, which, has, uh, which is a fairly useful document to cite and source, again, for more extensive details. The focus of this talk is 2D echo assessment of the RV. Finally, you can refer to this European Journal of Heart Failure article, which was recently released, which looks at contemporary management of acute right ventricular failure. This is a very useful document which goes through everything from anatomy, physiology, to echocardiographic assessment, other clinical parameters, and then finally on to managing specific indications where the, where the right heart is compromised. We can look to the American College of Chest Physicians guiding document for critical care medicine uh, curricula for critical care ultrasound. So our focus is on global RV size and systolic function and IVC size and respiratory variation and how these integrate to managing the critically ill patient. RV function is a critical component of focused cardiac ultrasound. However, it's often neglected. We spend a lot of time talking and focusing on the LV and it's sometimes hard to ignore, but it's also important to consider that the RV, which is immediately adjacent, also plays a vital role in the patient's hemodynamic status. Why do we care about RV function? Well, it may occur as a cause or a consequence of critical illness. It's also important to consider that, that patients can have pre-existing RV dysfunction, whether it's from chronic pulmonary hypertension and COPD or even sleep apnea. Acute respiratory distress syndrome, or ARDS, is a common pathology seen in the ICU, and this frequently leads to RV dysfunction, estimates as much as 25 to 50 percent. Dysfunction is often not appreciated, particularly to those new and learning focused cardiac ultrasound, as again, the focus is largely on the LV. It's important to realize there are several factors that help to distinguish the LV from the RV. There are also a variety of reasons why someone may confuse the two, whether it's the machine settings or the probe marker is on the wrong side. In this case, this is the normal presentation where the LV is displayed screen right the RV is displayed screen left, um, but you'll notice there are important features. First off, the 
tricuspid valve is apically displaced or more towards the apex than the mitral valve. You'll also notice that the LV is traditionally the apex forming chamber. There are cases where of course the RV can be dilated chronically and the RV can form the apex and this is what we will go on to discuss. But in most cases the LV is the apex forming chamber. You'll also notice that there is an outpouching uh, of the LV which occurs immediately in the intraventricular septum and this is the beginning of the left ventricular outflow tract and so this is not seen on the right, right ventricle. The RV is really meant as a low pressure large volume pump. It's not equipped to deal with the same degree of afterload increases as the left ventricular is and so the right ventricular pumps into the high volume, high compliance pulmonary circulation. And it's, it's a very thin wall compared to the LV and along with that is one-fifth of the bioenergetic equivalence compared to the LV. So it's really not adapted to dealing with high pressures and so it's, it's not meek, it's just different. And it's, it's more fragile to changes in, in the, in changes in afterload so why do we care? Well, they are susceptible to a host of problems, increased afterload, whether it's from the ventilator, uh, whether it's from clot, decreased contractility, whether it's from sepsis uh, or ischemia, preload alterations such as occurs in distributive shock, and also the milieu, milieu of critical illness. Things like acidosis and hypoxia. Vasopressors can also increase pulmonary afterload by leading to pulmonary vasoconstriction, high PEEP, and uh, ventilator settings such as high plateau pressures. Uh, importantly, this, this is a more difficult concept as that P may help overcome significant hypoxia and hypoxia itself obviously leads to uh, RV, just can obviously lead to RV dysfunction. Things like hypercarbia can obviously lead to acidosis and finally left ventricular failure and pre-existing pulmonary hypertension can also be uh, competing problems. So this is not an extensive list, but an important list to, uh, to be aware of. Finally, as noted, the RV is a thin-walled structure which, not accom which is not accommodated to uh, high afterload. And much like the puffer fish, it responds to it by dilating. This is a method which helps to maintain stroke volume in the face of increased afterload. So with an increase in pressure and afterload, we can see an increase in end diastolic volume and increase, increased contractility. This is an adaptive mechanism which helps to maintain stroke volume in the face of adversity. So how do we define right heart strain? This is a challenging uh, topic. There are a variety of causes, whether it's pulmonary hypertension, pulmonary embolism, RV infarction, and as listed here. If you look at the ECG, it might be suggested from ST depression in T wave inversion and inferior leads, which is an insensitive marker. The echo may show a dilated RV, systolic septal flattening, reduced systolic function, and these are all signs. Finally, on the CT, you may see RV dilatation and septal flattening in IVC contrast reflux. So it depends on which modality you're referring to. RV strain is actually a very non specific term to describe RV dysfunction. On a recent random poll, albeit a Twitter poll, 35 votes, 60% agreed that it was dilatation, dysfunction, and pressure overload of the RV that were necessary to call RV strain. Now, over, over, uh, around 40% felt uh, could be really any combination or were unclear this term. I think from this, I would suggest that, pay, that, that bedside sonographers focus on uh, specific entities, whether it's RV size, function are findings of increased pressure and remark those as being separate items rather than calling it collectively RV strain. So we'll go through systematically looking at RV anatomy and size, RV function, septal kinetics, and RV wall hypertrophy. First off, the personal long axis view is often one of the first views obtained uh, in a patient and um, the, we will draw attention to the right ventricle in the near field or this is actually the right ventricular outflow tract, so it's a bit of a misnomer. When we look at the size of this, uh, gross dilatation of the RV may show up in the personal lung axis, but it's a relatively insensitive area to look for RV dilatation. Generally speaking, we compare this intracardiac area into, into thirds, 
And so if this uh, space is greater than a third of intracardiac space, we would suggest that there is some RV dilatation. Again, one view is hypothesis generating. You need more views to confirm this. So on the apical four chamber, which is again non-foreshortened, we can compare the RV size to the LV size. Generally speaking, the RV is less than two-thirds of the LV. If you want to do a formal comparison, we can freeze it in diastole and trace the inner cavity on 2D. However, it's very important to mark that the, that the right ventricle has complex 3D geometry, and so this, this may be woefully inaccurate. So I would suggest that bedside visual assessment of a non-foreshortened view is probably the most reliable at the bedside. It's important to realize just because you found it doesn't mean it's new. And so when you find patients with artery dilatation, dysphagic dysfunction, or pressure changes, it's important to realize that there are a variety of factors which contribute to this, whether they're acute or chronic. And so it's, it's vitally important to consider a patient's context uh, when performing bedside cardiac ultrasound. Moving on to RV pressure and volume overload. In this case, this is normal septal kinetics. The LV cavity is circular in diastole and systole. And you'll notice the interventricular septum is convex towards the RV and concave towards the LV. And so this is what a normal septum looks like. When you talk about RV pressure and volume overload, you'll see change in septal kinetics. In the case of RV pressure overload in the first three panels, you'll see the overall septum takes on a D shape. And this D shape can persist through diastole and systole. However, it's proportionally worse in systole, as that is when the RV pressure is highest. On the second three panels, we can see RV volume overload. In this case, that D shape occurs way more proportionally in diastole than systole, as this is when the large volume influxes into the right ventricle. This is a personal short axis. We can see that during systole, the septum is more convex towards the RV, but in diastole, it flattens out. And so this is a suggestion of RV volume overload rather than pressure. In this case, we see again the persistent D shape of the interventricular septum. So this is likely to be a combination of RV pressure and volume overload, or it simply may just be pressure overload. Next, moving on to RV stalic function. As previously noted, this is mostly in the longitudinal plane from the annulus to the apex. So we use M mode to interrogate the lateral annulus. And of course, this has some degree of angle dependence, so it's important to make sure that you line up so the annulus is perpendicular to the M mode plane. A normal RV stalk function generally has a tapsy of greater than 1.7 centimeters. And what tapsy means is the tricuspid annular systolic plane excursion. It's a fancy word for saying the tricuspid annulus moves up and down uh, as displayed in the M mode screen here. And this is representative of longitudinal shortening of the RV. In this case, it's 2.34 centimeters, which is greater than 1.7, which is normal. TAPSI is actually a hemodynamic tool, and it's one of the best indicators of change RV function in response to therapy. One can actually monitor RV function on the basis of TAPSI alone. However, there are limitations. TAPSI is one component of RV motion, and it's angle dependent. The RV may be frankly dysfunctional despite a normal TAPSI and in fact may be unreliable in some cases of severe pulmonary tension and postcardiac surgery. The opposite may also be true. RV function may be globally normal despite significantly reduced TAPSI, which is often the case of in cardiac surgery, where intraoperative conditions can contribute towards hemodynamic abnormalities post-surgery. TAPSI can be used to rapidly identify patients with inferior MI in this select group of patients. We look at the IVC view, which uh, ensuring we have the maximal girth of the IVC on axis. We, if we freeze at end expiration, we can perform, first of all, uh, a caliper measurement, just distal to the hepatic vein. We can also ask the patient to either gently inspire or a gentle sniff to determine the collapsibility. This is in a spontaneously ventilating patient. So if the diameter is less than 2.1 centimeters and collapsibility is greater than 50%, that suggests a low or even normal right atrial pressure. 
if the diameter is greater than 2.1 centimeters at end expiration and the claspability is less than 50%, this suggests a high radiatorial pressure. If the patient's ventilated, it's more liable to use this central venous pressure as radiatorial pressure drawn from the central line. Again, this measurement comes with many caveats for assessment of fluid status. But it's important to realize that when patients have elevated right side of pressures, they may have a dilated, non collapsible IVC. Moving on to RV wall hypertrophy. Interestingly, the RV wall can, can thicken in as little as 48 hours after exposed to increased afterload and increased pressure. We can measure the RV free wall in the subcostal four chamber view at end diastole. Generally, we measure edge to edge, and less than 0.5 centimeters or 5 millimeters suggests normal. When greater than 0.5 centimeters, this suggests that there is RV wall hypertrophy, which may occur as a consequence of RV pressure overload. So this is one other helpful, helpful item which may help you characterize a patient's presentation. What about measuring RV systolic pressures? Well, this is an advanced hemodynamic assessment tool which requires further experience and training. So I would suggest really the focus of this tutorial is on dedicated to 2D assessment of RV function. So take home points, use multiple views, avoid foreshortening as this can lead to inaccurate assessment of the RV and LV. Take your time, perfect your views at first to ensure you're on axis. Of course, use your judgment as trying to perfect your views should not impact patient care. Be sure to consider contextual factors. We've gone through RV anatomy and size, RV function, septal kinetics, and RV wall hypertrophy. Again, there are multiple factors in RV assessment, and it's important to integrate into clinical context. I'd like to thank you for listening to this short tutorial. You can follow me on Twitter at UAlberta Critical Care Ultrasound. Our next rounds will be Christmas Jeopardy.